We've seen a surge in people looking up how to leave America. It's blowing up. Where could a Donald Trump go to escape? This idea that I live in the U.S., so I bank in the U.S., banish that from your mind. I think there's a geographical solution to every problem. And it's not just about your money. It's about happiness. It's about health in some ways, a healthier culture. I think too many people are letting other people live their lives. I like Dubai, but this idea that it's some panacea Right. I still think Singapore beats them in terms of private banking. You can't hide from the IRS. It's You're not, not hiding. This is not an intelligent thing. You're probably better yeah. off pissing off, you know, the Colombian mafia than, <laughs> than IRS. I was in Johannesburg, South Africa. I had yeah, a gun right. in my face in Managua, yes. Nicaragua. And but you never know. Gonna, I think I handled it much more cavalierly. That's a word. Most beautiful women you've encountered. You had to pick three countries. Where were you blown away? Welcome to today's show. It's Ty Lopez, and I have a very special guest, Andrew Henderson, CEO and founder of Nomad Capitalist. If you are at all interested in anything global, you've probably already heard or read. I've been on your email list for many years. It's actually, and I'm not just saying this because you're on the show, it's actually one of the few newsletters I try to read because it actually has good value and it's just not super generic. Uh, we're going to be talking about, you know, global planning, understanding the big picture of the world, not just taxes, but lifestyle and, you know, legalities and potential changes in capitalism and the world. And will the United States stay a dominant power for the next generation? And where should you be thinking, living, going? So, Andrew, I appreciate you being on. How are you? I'm doing great, man. It's good to talk to you. Like I said, I've been following your stuff and, and we've worked together. I've actually been in one of your uh, consulting packages. And so I wanted to just start off by a crazy question and we'll bring it back more sane. But I saw an article where it said, let's say Donald Trump. Okay. Donald Trump thinks he's unfairly, well, he's been indicted and unfairly accused. I read one of the most Googled things is like, where could a Donald Trump go to escape? Where could Pablo Escobar go? What are those countries where, because this extradition thing is an interesting subject because you take somebody, now you have in the news a lot, you have Andrew Tate dealing with things in Eastern Europe. Romania specifically, you have Donald Trump, you have Narcos was this huge show on TV and people see Colombia and they see this exotic thing. And I remember there was an American influencer who had all this stuff and they were talking about, oh, he's going to go to Armenia and all this stuff. <laughs> Do people often come to you with that question? Is, is that asked more often than you think? Well, with the Donald Trump thing, we, we just saw that on our YouTube uh, where to go to leave America is like blowing up. A lot of times huh. the older videos don't don't uh, get a lot more traction, but it was been blowing up out of nowhere recently. So I think people are looking at, in the United States, they're not looking to escape extradition, but they're right. saying, uh, hey, no, you know, I don't like Roe v. Wade being struck down, affirmative action being struck down. Maybe I'm more left wing. This country's falling apart. Or you're on the right wing. They're, they're going after Trump. I got to get out of here. This place doesn't work anymore. You know, our, our service, we, we like to work with, you know, people who are entrepreneurs, who are investors. I call myself the goody two shoes of the offshore world. Uh, so, yeah, if someone's looking to hide out somewhere, I'm probably not the guy they're, uh, they're going to call. Uh, <laughs> That's why I said this is a crazy question. I know those well, people. Pablo Escobar probably is not going to go to Nomad Capitalist and say. I mean, maybe, listen, hey. we, we, we get calls from a lot of people and it's crazy. But, I mean, you know, certainly during the crypto era, there are some people that you probably want to put a little distance between yourself. Uh, but I'll tell you this. The world is changing in a dramatic way to where, I mean, wh whatever side you may be on, look at the Russia-Ukraine war. And you may think, if you live in the West, I'm in Ireland right now. You know, you're in you're in Europe. Uh, we're both from the U.S. originally. Uh, hey, everybody's on the side of Ukraine. I supported people from Ukraine earlier. I said, hey, I've got some houses around the world. Come and stay in my house. But I sat next to a plane, or I sat on a plane uh, next to uh, you know, a guy from India. He was so pro Russia, and many wow. Indians I think are so pro Russia. Hmm. And you go to Indonesia, and you go to China, and you go to Brazil, and you go to South Africa. That's one of the big ones. I've got a couple of friends in South Africa. They said the Soviet Union helped us 
uh, back in the day, and we will always be on their side. We'll be on Russia's side. So all these countries that you and I in Western Europe and in the U.S. don't even really think much about, mm-hmm. they are becoming more powerful. Not all of them, but I mean, in some cases, their GDP grew 10x in this century what the U.S. has did in terms of growth. They're growing at a much faster pace. They're turning that into geopolitical power. They're turning it into financial power. You see the BRICS. You see the New Development Bank. You see what Brazil yeah. and Argentina would do. So I think that you're seeing a lot of countries in the world that are pushing back. I mean, yeah, if you look, look at Edward Snowden. Edward Snowden's in Russia. Edward yes. Snowden became a citizen of Russia after living there basically as a, on, you know, as a, as a political asylum seeker for years. So – I guess that's a country you can go Steven to. Steven Seagal went there too, became friends with Putin, and I think he left the U.S. and now is a Russian citizen. Uh, so yeah, Putin gave Steven Seagal citizenship. The president of Serbia gave Steven Seagal citizenship. I think that Adriana <laughs> Lima was given citizenship by the president of Serbia. That's, by the way, not that uncommon. I mean, look at Kevin O'Leary got citizenship of the UAE and others. They're starting to give away a few hundred citizenships a year in in Dubai to prominent people. So. I mean, I think a place like Dubai, people think, oh, that's the non-extradition place because they read it online. Dubai hands over people to the U.S. all the time. They don't want to get in – they don't want to – you know. but there are countries where they're like, the U.S. is not serving us. Why would we help them? We're we're doing our own thing. And so you're seeing these places become more and more powerful. Yeah. So, Andrew, my first question to you is if somebody wants to leave the U.S. because they think the world's going crazy and they think it's the fall of the Western world – Where do they go? We've actually seen a lot of people who are really worried about whether they're left wing, whether they're right wing. They're looking at how to leave the United States. And you've seen Supreme Court rulings that have bothered a lot of folks on the left. You've seen, you know, they're going after Trump. That bothers people on the right. We've seen a surge in people looking up how to leave America on our website, on our YouTube channel. It's blowing up uh, stuff that just wasn't getting as much traction. It's like 5X in the last week. Is that enough? Does that work for you? Yeah, perfect. Interesting, interesting. So let's let's talk for a second. I'm here with some friends in Europe, and they're Americans, and they've got global business and global customers. And you know, when I talk to different people, it it pretty much kind of vacillates between one of two things. People go, you know what? I look, I make money. I'm just going to pay my taxes. I'd love to do global planning, but it's too much of a headache. That's like. I've heard that even in the last week, I've been with different entrepreneurs and they're kind of like, oh, I bet you I could structure it better tax wise, legal liability wise, blah, blah, blah. And on the flip side, I meet people who are just building the world's most complex organism with this and that. And and I can see them getting bogged down. What's kind of a happy me? Let's just play a hypothetical scenario. Joe. Joe and Susie, married couple, they're American citizens, okay? They have an online business, they're selling, I don't know, online education, I have a lot of online education people follow me, and they have global audience, people from 190 countries paying them money. And currently, let's say in this hypothetical, they live in um, Atlanta, Georgia, they have an Atlanta, Georgia LLC, and they make $2 million a year in revenue with 500,000, let's say net, 20, 25% profit margins. It, what is a simple, and I, I don't expect you to be giving, it, it, you know, everybody should have their own account and everything we talk about on this podcast, disclaimer, this is just conversational. This is not legal advice. Don't go out and instantly act on this. But in that hypothetical situation, yeah. what's something that's not too complicated, yet more intelligent and strategic than just a basic US LLC? Well, so there's two categories of people, and one is Americans. Mm-hmm. And one is everybody else. So your yes. questions about Americans, a lot Americans. of people watching are Americans. I used to be an American. I, I gave it up, not not for this reason, although it's a nice benefit that I get to actually use my own money a bit more freely for my businesses. Um, so if you are British, if you're Canadian, if you're Australian, I think this will change. Uh, and Australia has already started to kind of sneak some stuff in there. But for now, if you're anything but American, you can simply leave your country and you can just Mm -hmm. play by wherever else's rules that you choose to go. And we've helped people move to 31 different tax-friendly countries. I mean, Italy's a tax-friendly country if you're a foreigner. Ireland is. Um, A lot of countries in Asia, Latin America, Europe can be tax-friendly. If you're an American, you're always going to have to pay something to the U.S. Now, assuming that no one wants to give up their citizenship or anything extreme like that, you know, if your company is majority owned by Americans, you're going to have to pay something. 
mm-hmm. but it may be in the single digits at that at that five hundred thousand dollar number, because uh, what you get as an American is not only a bit more flexibility of where you go, um, in terms of when you leave the U.S., uh, but you also get a foreign earned income exclusion. So let's call it about ten thousand dollars a month. Changes a little bit every year. If you're a husband and wife and you both legit work in the business, that's 240 basically out of the 500. And if you structure it to where you're working for a foreign corporation, you basically should pay nothing, no income, no social security, no Medicare on that. If you're a married couple, both Americans, 240. Now you've got 260. Maybe you pay $25,000 in tax if you move to a tax neutral place. So that could be a place with no income taxes. That could be a place that doesn't tax your business as long as it's not in the country. So let's say you move to Malaysia. Um, you know, Malaysia, generally speaking, won't tax businesses that are set up somewhere else. Maybe your business is in the UAE, but you are living in Malaysia. The thing to understand, and by the way, they may not need to get rid of that Georgia LLC, but they probably need to add one part to it, maybe a foreign company. So they don't have to, they don't even have to necessarily move the entire business as an American. That's the cool thing if you're doing an LLC. But, uh, you know, it's not just enough to move your assets anymore. You have to move your <clears throat> you have to move your tuchus. You got to move your butt somewhere else. The idea that you're going to be sitting in the United States or Canada or Australia and just setting up your company in some tax-free jurisdiction while you're in the U.S. They have things called controlled foreign corporation rules. They have yeah. permanent establishment. So even if you have employees, you know, depending on what they do, you might want to structure them. That's when it gets more complicated. Like. You want to make this move before you have a bunch of employees. I ran businesses in the U.S. I sold everything, and when I was running Nomad at the beginning, I started it overseas. We've never really hired anybody in the United States, so yeah. I've been able to avoid the comp. If you've got 30 employees, we can work with that, but that's going to be more complicated. But if you're just selling stuff online and you've got – like that's the ideal kind of business – that person probably pays about 5 or 6% tax. There are ways with foreign partners. There are ways with renunciation. There's ways with other things to get it down to zero. If you didn't want to leave the U.S. and you wanted to move to Puerto Rico, you can get it down to probably about the same. There's a few different aspects of Puerto Rico. But I think most people like the idea, especially if you're American, you could spend you know, 9, 10, 11 months anywhere you want in the world as long as you're not getting into some other country's tax net. And for that person making half a million dollars and they're married, they'd probably pay five or 6%. Yeah. Now if somebody's making, let's take the same couple and their business blows up yep. and they're grossing 25 million. I always say the magic number is 29 and a half million. A mentor once told me, Ty, 18 million is a great number. It's stable. It shows the market's large enough, big enough to hire a C-suite. So if you'd, he told me that when I was a teenager, so inflation adjusted. So twenty nine and a half million. Let's say this Atlanta couple, they got a twenty nine and a half million dollar business, 10, 15 percent margins. They're walking with two to five million net. Now that two hundred forty thousand exclusion isn't yep. helping them much. So as an right. American citizen, what are assuming they don't want to renounce and revoke yes. their citizenship because there's an exit tax on that. We can talk about that later. But that's the other issue. What what are you seeing people do in that type scenario? The same strategy. Um, so, you know, there are the tax code got more complicated, but there's yes. ways to 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 structure around that to where uh, basically, you know, let's say you're going to pay ten or eleven percent of whatever's left over, and so in this case, you have a much bigger whatever's left over. So yeah. you're never really going to get much into the double digits. You might get right there on the nose. Um, so if you're making, you know, two and a half million dollars, yeah, I mean, ninety percent of your income is now subject to that. So maybe you're paying, you know, nine or ten percent tax. These are rough numbers. Obviously, it depends on your situation. Um, again, you know, could you go and say uh, we want to sell a chunk of our business to a foreign investor? You can get it down, um, but. So by having you know, a partner, what does that? What is that doing for well, it's, them? It's, it's what's the percentage ownership that's that's American, right? So you're right. going to want to run the business from overseas, but I mean, if your spouse is not American, for example, I mean that could be yes. because someone we have some clients. Hey, listen, one of us is willing to, you know, uh, we had a, a couple recently. The husband was able to qualify for Irish citizenship through his grandparents. They figured that's as good as a U.S. citizenship. I can probably come back and visit. I don't want to live in the U.S. anymore. I'll just be Irish and not American. 
That's yeah. an extreme move. Or if your spouse is just already not American and then they're not liable for taxes in the U.S., like, you know, if, you're, if your wife is British, as long as she doesn't have a green card or something, uh, you, can, you can lower that. So, I mean, for the average person, if you're paying – if you're making millions, I mean, you're paying 40 percent plus. Oh, yeah. And I think a lot of people, you said, I mean, I, Alex Hermosi and I, without mentioning each other, kind of had this friendly uh, battle. He's a very nice guy to us. But he's like, you know, I pay 0% tax on 59% of my income. And I responded that it doesn't have to be that complicated to structure this stuff. I mean, if you're just running an online e-learning company, maybe you've got a couple of employees that gum things up a little bit. You yes. have to file, you know, Form 5471 in the U.S. for your your foreign corporations. If you've got, you know, U.S. entities that are, you know, involved in that, it's another form. And this is not tax advice, but, you know, there's a lot of forms to file. Bank accounts have to be reported. All of this is being reported to the Treasury, to the IRS, uh, one or the other. And, and you're going to be somewhere else. And so the idea is it's already a little bit ridiculous that the U.S. makes you pay anything when yes. you're not There's using their roads. two countries in the world that it, 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 that tax you whether or not you live in the country. It's one African country. What There's was a tiny the little country, African like? country of Eritrea, which has a diaspora tax of 2% yeah. that nobody pays. And the U <laughs> United Nations condemned them. The U.S., again, you can get it down to single digits. So from 40 to 5 is still pretty – you probably aren't renouncing oh, your yeah. citizenship, right? So people say, Andrew renounced his citizenship for tax. Believe me, okay, 5%. If I loved the country so much, I would have gladly paid the 5%, yes. right? It's so just, you left the U.S. for other lifestyle reasons, yeah. philosophical reasons, I'm assuming. Yeah, personal, philosophical. And I continue to learn more about that and learn more about some of the personal motivations – but if you know, if I were such a lover of the country, I would have gladly paid five percent. And by the way, my spouse is not American, so I probably could have just ended up paying zero percent. Um, but that's how you do it, and so you can scale that very nicely. There's not really a lot to do now. The issue that you mentioned is there's an exit tax. Yes, we've had people who they've hired us two or three different times. One guy, I think his business was ten million or something, and then the third time it was fifty million, and he's in the process of selling it. If you're selling a business, I mean that's a that's a ostensibly a long-term capital gain. So he had an extra $10 million tax bill. If he would have done the exit earlier, it would have been much yes. more comfortable. So, you you know, in terms of exiting the system, $2 million generally is the magic number. If you think that you don't want to, you know, leave the U.S. forever, Puerto Rico is an option to consider because... You mean when your net worth is $2 million or what's $2 million? Yeah, when your net worth is $2 million or if you've paid a lot of income taxes or if you, or you're not in tax compliance. But generally speaking, $2 million is the number where after that, if you choose to exit the U.S. for good, they're going to come after you. So if you're building that business, making 500000 maybe in some, you know, many in many spaces, it's already worth more. Now, the tax man may value it differently than... Right, some venture capitalist would. So you have to consider what's their valuation. Maybe that's only three yes. X. I don't know. But um, you, you know, most people just take the renunciation piece. That's extreme off the table. If you can go from yeah, going forty back to, this, to five this or Atlanta, six, yeah, yeah, going back to this Atlanta couple. Let's say they don't want to renunciate, but they're o uh, renounce. I should yeah. say, but they're okay with spending time out yes. of the U.S. Let's take Puerto Rico off because I, I live in Puerto Rico fairly familiar with that but let's just say you know th they don't want to live full-time in puerto rico and they don't want to renounce their citizenship and they need to be in georgia atlanta in this hypothetical how much time are you do they need to be outside the u.s is this so they need to be pretty much more than three months only uh, nine months out of the u.s yeah it's kind of the threshold i think that generally the threshold if you are going to be if if you want to do whatever you want which is what i did because i just didn't want to be in the u.s at all i spent zero days some years uh most years uh you're going to be out for 11 months now again what's cool Good. about the u.s is other western countries are like but where are you going I've got a friend from Norway for three years after he leaves. He doesn't have to pay the exit tax, but they tell him where he can go for three years wow. if, if he wants to avoid it. So he can pick from a list of countries. Mexico does the same thing. I think Finland does the same thing. So huh. you can live wherever you want. So what I did was I'd be like, oh, I'll go to Malaysia for two months. I'll go here. I'll go there. You can travel as much or as little as you want. If you want to settle in one place, the rules are a bit more gray. But I would generally think, and this would, is probably applicable to a lot of Western citizens, you want to be gone for eight to nine months a year. What's that threshold reason that you couldn't say this hypothetical 
couple couldn't stay six months in Atlanta or five months in one day or, you know, right under kind of that half a year. Is that a specific statute that says in order to qualify for X, Y, Z, you need to be outside the U.S. Nine yeah, so there's so what what allows you to take that give or take ten thousand dollars a month the foreign earned income exclusion? Uh, by the way, you don't have to have a company to do that. I mean, you can go and have a job and you can get that yeah. foreign earned income exclusion. So I had a friend who was a banker in Dubai. He made a lot more than ten thousand a month, but that but you know Dubai the UAE did not tax him more. So it was only the U.S. and then the first again ten grand or give or take was was exempt. So to trigger that, you have to, to, to basically meet one of two tests. One is just physical presence. Hey, you know, sayonara, who cares what you're doing? You know, and that's where you don't really get much time back in the U.S. at all. The other one is a bit more about like all the different factors involved and, um, you know, how connected are you to this other place? Are you a citizen? Are you a resident? Do you have a home? Like your kids go to school? It's, it's kind of more of a subjective test. And so this idea that people, it's kind of an old school that like just the days test. A lot of countries have a days test. If you spend 183 days in the country, we'll tax you. Theoretically, yeah. if I had nothing else protecting me, if I just went as a, as a tourist to Australia for 183 days, they could tax me. Yes. Now, if I pay taxes somewhere else and maybe there's a closer, whatever. But theoretically, they could nail me. But that does not mean the inverse is true, that if you only spend 182, you're covered. Now, for Americans, Puerto Rico, perhaps, depending on how you do it, does allow you the most time back in the U.S. And so mm -hmm. if your goal is maximizing time in the U.S., then that's what you should do. It's a little bit hard for me because, I mean, again, my goal was I thought um, the nicest, most understanding, most open to entrepreneur, most beautiful women, <laughs> the people I wanted to hang out with, the businesses I wanted to invest in, like I wanted to see the other countries. I understand some people, their goal is, what's the least I need to do to save taxes? I think that perhaps will get you in a bind where you see these guys go down to Puerto Rico and then they start talking about how they're going to get on some kind of like cigarette boat and smuggle themselves back into the U.S. <laughs> like, you don't want to do that. And, and they we're can seeing... track you with your credit card. They can track you with... Uh... Oh, I no, mean, I mean, don't Monaco are games. the experts in this. Yeah, Monaco, they, they, they got the police like tracking. Are you there? Every day you're supposed to be there. Right. I mean, they're sending people. So, and by the way, the IRS is now really cracking down on people who are just pretending to be in Puerto Rico. I mean, so I think Puerto Rico is the most flexible. If you want to be overseas for any Western country, I think you've got to be gone eight, nine months a year. So let's say this couple, and then we'll move on to a different line of thinking, but I think people will find this interesting. Going back to Atlanta, hypothetical married couple. Let's say they go, we don't want to renounce. We also don't want to spend nine, 10 months outside the U.S. Are there other uh, advantages that they can pick up on while still living in the U.S., yet maybe having a company outside? The, is there any reduction in risk, taxes, et cetera, if they say, we need to spend six to eight months in the U.S.? Or is that pretty much... There's nothing well, there. I, I mean, obviously, you know, Tim Cook is the CEO of Apple, and he's sitting in Cupertino. Mm -hmm. uh, and Apple obviously has – I mean, here in Ireland, I mean, one of the you – know, Apple's one of the original people using Ireland to, to, to shift profits to a lower tax rate. So, you know, do we occasionally see people who have very complex businesses and very big businesses where you can do some of that? It's not necessarily our, our, our focus. But, you know, certainly you could, you could apply you know, somewhere between – the Georgia family and and Apple, there's an opportunity mm. um, where you can have you know serious stuff in the U.S. That's you know that's certainly not uninvolved. Uh, what I would suggest is perhaps if I'm starting a business, I could incorporate that business in part overseas. Now I have to file a foreign return, uh, or sorry, a, a, a U.S. return for that foreign company. So I'm going to have a little bit of extra paperwork. And I'm not going to save the tax because the, the company will be taxed as if it's a U.S. company. But I am going to potentially have lighter weight requirements. Let's say my company's in the UAE. I can get anybody a visa to work for me. So mm. it's not the cheapest place to hire people. And I don't think you're getting top level A-plus talent in Dubai um, from experience. But... <laughs> 
I mean, no, it's people think it's some panacea, but you know, you could bring people from anywhere in the world, and that's a selling point for certain people. So if you want to say, hey, listen, the best SEO guys for my business are in Pakistan. They'd like to move to the UAE. I'm willing to pay them between Pakistan and US wages. I save some money. They get a work permit. Maybe that helps me retain them. I can bring anyone to work for me there. So there's benefits for the business in terms of cost savings, in terms of streamline. We had a guy who worked with us a couple different times. He wanted to move the business to Singapore. He said, I'm just, I'm tired of hiring Americans. I'm tired of the filing requirements. They come at me seven years ago. Why did you fire this guy? I don't want it anymore. He's not, he doesn't care about saving taxes. So if you're willing to move, unless your business is just big and you've got a lot of people in different places, maybe there's something to be done. But if you're just like, hey, there's four of us, it's really not going to be possible. I mean, the people running the business have to, and really, even the people doing substantial work in the business, which if you've got four or six or eight employees, most people are going to be called pretty substantial. If that's your business, you're going to have a hard time uh, doing that. You know, if, if, if a company at our level, we've got 60 people, could I put a few people in the U.S.? You know, probably that's an easy enough way to structure that. Um, but, you know, you've got to be kind of at the level that we're at 60 people or more, I would say, before you can really, it's really justified to say, we're going to we're gonna not be out. But, but there's plenty of things you could be doing otherwise. You know, you could be getting your dual citizenship. You could be banking overseas. I mean, look at uh, all these different countries that are freezing people's accounts. Or, I mean, the, the woman who sold burritos 10 years ago, oh, she's depositing too much cash. Let's take all of our money. And then she can't even defend herself. I mean, having business bank accounts somewhere else, all that stuff is good just for asset protection and diversification. But I think tax requires movement. Yeah. In the context that we're talking about, if we're not Apple. For somebody listening who just loves the world, forget taxes. They want to live a global life. They want yeah. to diversify. They want to have assets globally. It has nothing to do per se, you know, necessarily about taxes. They don't know how many days they want to spend in the U.S. So they don't want to be tied to that, but they want to diversify globally. So they want to diversify maybe where they own real estate. They maybe want to have a backup plan. Uh, they want to enjoy life. They want their kids to experience other cultures. Let's go through kind of three parts of the world. Because everybody has different tastes. I can't just say, hey, Andrew, what's the best place in the world? Because there's so much subjectivity to that. And, you know, like if you ask me, I've been to a lot of countries in the world. I've lived all over and I have my preference. I like Scandinavia. You know, I spend a lot of time in Scandinavia. I like Brazil, some parts of South America. You know, I've been to the Middle East. I've been to Asia um, for various reasons, partly time zones and things like that. I, I tend to be a little more Western. Yes. Um, but for you, just with your, and you don't even have to explain your predilections and personal preferences, but what are the three parts of the world? If you were starting from scratch now, let's say yeah. you lived in Atlanta, Georgia, and you just said, I'm going to live a global life. I'll still have my Georgia, you know, US LLC and operations here, but I want to spread out. I want to have a second home maybe, or I want to invest some real estate that I'm going to Airbnb out, or I want to, you know, spend five months here and my kids go partly to school there. What what are those three countries or even specifically cities? Because I think sometimes countries is the wrong way to think about it. What what are the cities, three cities that you would put in your rotation? I call it, a, I, I call it a travel rotation. What would be your what, travel rotation? Yeah, I created the concept of what I call the trifecta, which for me, not being in the US was you get three places about four months a year. And if none of mm -hmm. those are like really Western places, you wouldn't trigger tax. You said we're not worried about tax. Um, let's talk about Latin America. We do have a lot of people who say, yes, I like the Western time zones. I don't, you know, I trade stocks or I just talk to my employees, whatever, customers are there, whatever, I've got to do it. Um, and yes, I've been on too many of these podcasts at two in the bloody morning in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. Uh, I hear you. <laughs> yeah. um, so Latin America, I mean, I think Mexico City has become popular. I was telling people eight years ago, why don't you consider Mexico um, like when Trump was running, people should move to Mexico, not to Canada. I think Mexico City is a great city. I like cities. Um, yeah. and I think there's safe enough places in Mexico, in Mexico City. Um, I don't see a ton of value in Central America. I find Panama City to be okay. It's livable. Mm -hmm. Um, the rest, I don't know that, for, I mean, if you're looking for adventure, you can go there. Um, if you're looking for total freedom, maybe. I have a home in Bogota, Colombia. I happen to like that. I think that um, there's a lot of 
you know, interesting benefits there. If you're there four months a year, it's not going to be a problem. Um, I, I have it for Northern South America to Southern South America, although certainly okay. the more stable countries like Uruguay, um, you know, from tax, from freedom to all the different, you know, there's a lot of benefits in Uruguay. I'm not banking, by the way, in Latin America. The banking okay. hub for Latin America is Miami. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, what I may Belize? be- People talk a lot about Belize. More of a retirement place, I think. I mean, I think but I that, mean for banking specifically, eh, small banking, maybe. I, yeah. I think that's for someone who it's like, I want to have a you know a company offshore. I have very little funds to put in it. You know, I'm not going to be resident anywhere. I go and get an account in Belize or Dominica or something. I think it doesn't blow me away for banking. No, um, could it be an option in there? Sure. I, I'm just. It shouldn't be like that. Doesn't replace Switzerland or Singapore. Yeah. Um, so that's where I would go. Yeah, I mean, you've got Roatan, the island off of Honduras. If you were to live there, you could get citizenship relatively easily, for example. And that's not a bad citizenship. As much as you think all oh, the Hondurans are coming to the U.S., um, their citizenship is not bad on a global level. So if you like that kind of thing, you know, my friend Mark Moss likes to go and surf. I mean, Nicaragua has some great places on the western, on the Pacific coast. El Salvador is being cleaned up. Uh, so, you know, Latin America, I think there's not as many options. Um, if you buy property in some of those countries, you can get residence. Do you like, um, do you like Bogota? You feel safe there? You know, you, 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 you could, you see a family bringing their kids down there four months out of uh, the year, three months out of the year. I mean, I've been doing this for a long time, so maybe I'm just a little bit acclimated. The only places I felt unsafe, I was in Johannesburg, South Africa. I had yeah, a gun I, in my face in Managua, yes. Nicaragua. And but you never know. You're gonna. I think I handled it much more cavalierly. If that's a word than I than I would have ever imagined. Have a guy put a what gun. Happened, what happened in, your in face. Nicaragua? Um, I was much younger and I was cheaping it out. And I walked back from a bus station. I went to some other city for the day, and I, people were like shocked. I walked back. I made it all the way back next to the little store next to my hotel. <laughs> And I'm coming out of the store. It's twilight in February, 6 o'clock at night or something. I turn the corner out of this little store to walk to my hotel 50 meters down the way. And a motorcycle comes. There's a guy driving. There's a guy gets off the back. He just comes up, put his, puts a gun in my face. And it was weird because I had just gotten my friend the same wallet I had, this lovely, uh, was it a Xenia wallet, except his was sewn shut on both sides, so you can't put cash in. And mine ah. was the last one they ever made with like, with an open one side. And I'm like, I'm sorry, I, they don't make this one anymore. You can't have it. And uh, he finally just took my my cell phone and and ran off. I was pretty. Jeez. Probably shouldn't have done. That. I know a guy who went to Johannesburg filming an influencer. He got his hands zip tied. They broke into his house when he slept. Followed him home. He was like, shoot, my friend. One of my friends said, don't be shooting with your big expensive cameras in Johannesburg. This guy did it. Zip tied yeah. behind his hands, duct taped his mouth, and three of these robbers slash kidnappers were arguing whether they should kill him or not. And uh, two were like, "Ah, kill him!" He saw our face, and the one, and it was face down, tied. Well, he got out of that country when they, but luckily the one guy said, "Ah, let's not kill him." And uh, he never went back to <laughs> Johannesburg. Everybody says go to Cape Town. Cape Town is uh, is nice. Yeah, I got some great friends there. Joe Berg is. Uh, yeah, I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't go there. So I mean, I is there crime in Bogota? Sure. In Latin America is statistically more unsafe. That's yeah. really the one part of the world that is statistically more unsafe for violent crime than the U.S. The U.S. is in like the lowest. It's like in the fortieth yeah. percentile or something. Well, what for about violent Brazil? Crime. What about Brazil? When I, I was I, talk, know, I interviewed. You know. Uh, the sovereign man. I interviewed yeah. him. He's down in Uruguay, and he was talking about Buenos Aires. Doug Casey. What do you What do you think about Brazil? Yeah, Doug Over. Casey, who yeah. we, we're, we have a, a live event, and Doug Casey's in Uruguay. He's in Argentina. I I agree with Doug Casey that like the problems of Argentina don't follow you if you're just the foreigner. That's like right. when you're an expat in these cultures, you're floating above it in a sense. Yes. Um. You don't – even in a place like Ireland where I'm at, like do I get involved in the politics? Americans are like, what? how am I going to protest what the government's right. doing? It's like it probably doesn't impact you, and you're <laughs> not going to like, complain somewhere. You know what I mean? Yes. 
Um, so I, I mean, it's not my bag. I, I don't know as much about Brazil. I certainly know a lot of people who are down in the South, like down by Uruguay. And that's, I think maybe among the better places I'm hearing a lot more about Fortaleza, even the, the taxi driver yesterday is like, I'm looking at Fortaleza. He's, he's really into our stuff. Um, so, you know, the Brazil is becoming more and more open. I, you know, the benefit of going to a Spanish speaking country is although the Spanish is very different in all those countries. I mean, Bogota is a very easy place to to learn Spanish because it's it's yes. rather kind of pure Spanish. I don't know. I mean, is Portuguese going to serve you? So unless you just love Brazil yeah. um, or you love it's such Portugal. such a big market when you think BRICS countries. It's Brazil yeah. is first, Russia, India, China, South Africa, you know. So, yeah, OK. So the language I, 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 for I, I, sure. I I know so many guys who are like, I, I mean, you go to Brazil and I mean, women are really nice to you and it's just, a, it's a, you know, I, I don't know if it goes the other way around, but you know, people talk about it for that. Um, well, what I look at, I always say, you know, I talk about the four pillars of the good life. And I think there's so many ways to plan your life. The best framework that I've found is, you know, the purpose of life, I call it the seven B's. Right. They're like subsets of the four pillar, but bloodline, friends, family, romance. If you ask a scientist, the human, the homo sapien organism, what is the dominating instinct? It's reproduction. And that's both genetically, but also through your friends and alliances. So I look at countries and there's a new meta study came out in the last few years of globally, global mental illness, global instability at the individual level. So dark triad traits like narcissism, psychopathy, Machiavellianism. And I really think, and I'm interested to get your take on this, I look at the world through that lens because you can find anything in any region. So the region that has the lowest statistical mental illness, and we'll put this on the show notes, anybody listening, tylopez.com slash Andrew podcast. I'll put the link to this study. Brazil is statistically the lowest dark triad mentally unstable exploitative trait location in the world so i was um, talking to some friends of mine about the social scene and they're like yeah i mean like from a sense of you know cheating for example and stuff like that you know i was talking to a, a, a woman from venezuela and she says yeah i mean brazil it seems like scores higher in some of that stuff well but don't get confused with brazil that's crime higher in a good way a, yeah yeah but but brazil I, everywhere you're going to encounter petty crime and sure. you know but the by the way, the most unstable part of the world is basically, and I hope nobody gets mad, you can read the studies in Middle East and Eastern Europe. They have very, very off the charts, some parts of Africa too. Um, so, you know, when people think about where you should live, I go, well, there's a concept in economics of thick and thin markets, meaning you will find good people anywhere, but some markets are thick and full of people who are more likely to be cooperators with you in life, whether it's mm. marriage, because you can't just go off pretty women because there's pretty women who are mentally stable and there's pretty <laughs> nothing more dangerous in this world than a pretty face with an unstable personality, right? So, so uh, I've yeah. spent a lot of time in Eastern Europe, which is, I mean, you could, we could say that's the, you know, Europe being the second or the, the second of the three kind of locations. I, I think that, I mean, certainly, yes, there, are, there are people, I mean, we've got a big team in Georgia, for example. I've been an advocate for Georgia. I think people there are more cooperative. There are certainly countries in Eastern Europe where people are relatively uncooperative, even though um, there's a lot of positives. I mean, beautiful people. Um, it's laid back. A lot of people have gone to places like Serbia because they kind of leave you alone. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, the government is just... They, by the way, I mean, it really is a difference. I flew to Serbia recently from Eastern Europe. I mean, just the way people dress, the way people look. I mean, you get off the plane, there's someone in like these sky high heels, please walk up the, like you would never have this in Western Europe. Um, but is that the place where you want to go? I don't know. I mean, th those people know how to fight. I think they know old school values. Uh, is everyone in Eastern Europe going to cooperate with you? You know, maybe, maybe not. Um, so, I mean, I, I feel safe in Bogota. Is a family going to go there? I don't know. I mean, you have to have a little bit of a zest. And that's the challenge for North Americans who... I mean, unless you're going to go down to like Uruguay or something, that's which is a stretch. Um, you know, Latin America has some drawbacks. I guess you could live on an island in the Caribbean, but I mean, Latin America has higher rates of violent crime. Everywhere else in the world, I mean, Eastern Europe and the Middle East too, they have some of the lowest rates. I mean, 
I mean, I was just talking to a guy who grew up in Saudi Arabia. There's no crime there. Now, maybe that you're going too far the other direction on the culture scale, but there's no crime in the UAE to speak of. There's no crime in Bahrain. There's a relatively, you know, open, you know, for, for that region. Um, I think there are other negative externality, like Copenhagen, where I live part time, you know, is just as high a level of safety. Yeah. But with still the freedom, you know, sometimes you have, <laughs> it's like, let's be real. You know, some countries are women can't drive. It's like, well, do you yeah. want to live there? Do you want to live yeah. in the place? Like we under, I understand that modern look to me, I'm a, I'm a fan of the middle way. And so ultra feminism can be catastrophic for society, but also ultra patriarchy is no no, and, and, <laughs> it's no, and, and, it's, it, yeah. it's no beautiful sail down the wonderful life with no negative repercussions. So I, I, I certainly wouldn't say I'm the most politically correct person, but I've been in countries where I say to myself, "My goodness, like the patriarchy, it really exists, and it's right here." Um, and by the way, I mean, I, you know, I go go to Albania, for example, and try and date someone. I haven't really done this, but you know, you hear all the stories. I mean, like, you know, I was talking to an Albanian woman last year just at a store. And she's like, you're going to get married in a week or the brother is <laughs> going to come and they're going to get in the back of your car with a bat and it's going to be like, yeah. listen, you're, you're done. Um, you don't want that, Andrew? You don't want to get a week old marriage <laughs> by bat? I, mean, I just watched that movie Shaft on Netflix, which is like Samuel L. Jackson. And he's trying to get Charlize, uh, not Charlize Theron, but I forget the main actress to testify in a court case, a murder. And her brothers come out the backyard with these two big baseball bats or these big, huge white guys. And so maybe they were Albanian. Who knows? I, I mean, I, you know, I don't want to contribute because, you know, you watch all the, you, every spy show is like, oh, the Serbians or the Albanians are the villains. Like Russians, people I think know a little bit too well at this point. So now they've got to be more exotic. I think there's some great people there. Um, there's always great people everywhere. I, I just, you, it, know? It, you know, it's, it's just... It's just kind of old school sometimes. I, I don't know. I don't, I don't want to presume. I, I've known some Albanians. We have Albanians who, who work here. I mean, you know, it's not There's like – There's a lot uh, in London. I'm in London now. Oh, for sure. Albanian, well, it's like and some of those beautiful women you'll meet are Albanian. Absolutely. Like you said, you may have to marry them in four days after your fourth marry- date. <laughs> so yeah, they're not going to – Yeah, If you're not, on a fast you know, track for marriage, there you go. The question is, is that what they want? I mean, I think certainly the idea of – I mean, are people in the Western world happier – by, I mean, I, I don't, I'm not really the game, but like, what is it like? It's a situation ship now. I mean, I, I just kind of hear this stuff for the grapevine and it just seems like, is that what's making people happier? Uh, there's a great book, uh, many years, probably a dozen years ago at this point called the geography of bliss. The happiest people I think are the ones who don't really give too much thought to some of this stuff. Um, and so there's places in <laughs> Southeast Asia, for example, but anyway, I mean, Eastern Europe is a bit more of a stretch. I, I'm spending more time in Ireland and Dublin, Ireland. Uh, the reason being, you've gone I've, back to your Anglo roots a little, a little bit. bit. A, a well, little what, bit. Are because, you English? Are you English by? I guess background? my Henderson's my father's side English was name. yeah Scottish and Welsh. I think. Yeah, so yeah. you're UK, you, United Kingdom ish. Yeah, and my mother Lithuanian and Norwegian. Um, so Norway, I love. I used to live in Oslo, Norway. Too far God's away. So, uh, unfortunately, and I'd you like think? to claim one of those. Well, no, I'd love to claim one of those citizenships, but Norway doesn't really do that unless your parents are Norwegian and Lithuanian. Yeah. My gra- my great grandparents left two years too early. It wasn't Lithuania yet, okay. and they said, "Sorry, you can't be Lithuanian." Um, I yeah, I, I like Dublin, and so. Uh, you know, we have some people in our audience who say, listen, I want total freedom. I don't want to be told what to do. I don't want to be told what to say. I think Ireland is still, there's a humility to it that a lot of continental Europe doesn't have. But, I mean, you're still in the European Union. And so if you just want, like, total leave me alone, you're going right. to Serbia or something like that. I'm willing to sacrifice. I went to Serbia it. last year. It's a cool place. It's, it's like, cool. It's, you know, I was there. It's, it's inexpensive. I was in Brazil. My Uber was 89 cents. I kept getting my bank block blocking my cards, and I'm sure their algorithm is like a whole bunch of 89 cent right. Uber charges is some spammer. I called the bank 43 times. I'm in Brazil for the love of God. Can you compute <laughs> your algorithm? Can you alter the algorithm to not be so blind? You know, Eastern so, Europe is not as cheap now with all the Russians and Ukrainians moving in. Yeah. Ask ask any of our team members in Georgia, the country of Georgia. 
Um, I mean, things have gone through the roof. I mean, we were talking about buying property there six, seven years ago. We had people who have tripled their money on property. Um, I have some land that apparently just got appraised at 40 times what I paid for it, which wow. obviously land being more illiquid. Struck let's see gold. if I can get that. But yeah, I, I think I'm turning like turn like seven grand into like 220 <laughs> grand or something. That's like nice. The best being 40X potentially. Anyway. That's in Georgia. Yeah, my mom went to Georgia. She used to follow this goop. My mom's a hippie. I was born in Southern California. She follows the, this guy. He's dead now. His name is Guru Fozzy, Fossey or something. So she went to Georgia, I don't know, 10 years ago. She's like, oh, I love it. It's a hell of a flight over there. It took her forever to get it's easier. there. It's easier now, but yeah. Yeah, she yeah. was like, oh, and she came back and, you know. Now, so, okay, so we got the first place. You obviously, Columbia, you have a place. That's a great way to know people's preferences. And you're in Ireland. So what yep. would be a, a third locale that you, just your preferences? Like I said, you don't have to justify it per se. So again, my, having gone all over Asia, the place that I identified with the most, number one, because of the nice people, and number two, because it's a little more comfortable, was, was Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. Okay. Most of our Australians, they go up to Penang because they want to be in the water. And Penang's nice also. But I think Kuala Lumpur is a world-class city. I've had my parents come. Everyone who comes says, this is... Better than many American cities, quite frankly, in terms of the services, hmm. in terms of just is everything. Is it glo global expats or is it mostly Malaysians there? Well, so Malaysia, and this is why we, by the way, we're having a big live event and I wanted to show people Kuala Lumpur. Yes, we've done I'm all of our live events in Mexico. We're going to get there. But yeah, I, I, we've been doing all of our events in Mexico over the years. Mm -hmm. And I thought it's time to show people somewhere I've been living for 10 years. I have properties in Kuala Lumpur. Is it global? Uh, I think a lot of the expats left. I mean, if you're someone who, uh, I mean, the, the, you know, Asia is is more of a group culture. Yes. So not everyone got vaccinated, but mm -hmm. there certainly was a bit more enforcement. It's all over now, but Asia is a place where when people get sick, they wear a mask, that kind yes. of thing. So if that's not your thing, then Asia is not your thing. But right now, Malaysia is wide open. Um, and so there were more expats there. I just think that, you know, I, I think they're still very friendly to expats. Maybe some people didn't. I don't know why. Um, but it's it's mostly that Malaysia is a multicultural country. It's about 60 percent Malay, which are the ruling powers. They mm -hmm. are the Muslims uh, that are in charge. They are some of the nicest people you'll ever meet. There's the Malaysian Chinese, which is about 25 percent. And so you've got Chinese people that are Malaysian citizens. They're, they don't want to be Chinese. They're Malaysian Chinese. That's a, a cut above, they say. Um, <laughs> well, that's what they say. Right. Yeah. But, you know, they're in Indonesia. They're in the Philippines. And they're generally in all these Southeast Asian countries, the wealthiest people, because they bring that work ethic. They are, you know, the lawyers and all that. Then you have about 15% Indians. And then you've got expats, not as many Western expats anymore, but you've got Egyptians and Yemenis and people uh, from all over the world. Uh, they are you know, a country that welcomes Muslims. I will say this, if you're not Muslim, they don't care what you do. And so in contrast, perhaps, to the Gulf, you will see people kissing. You will see girls wearing the skimpiest outfits, uh, as long as they're not Muslim. Uh, you will see people drinking. I guess even plenty of Muslims do that. They're not supposed yeah. to, but it's a very liberal uh, and open Muslim country. And so, cost of, I, how's like, cost of living there? I think with what's happening in Eastern Europe, I still think it's among the best. I mean, Colombia with the currency always kind of going down is good, but the ringgit in Malaysia has gone down. I mean, I'll tell you what. I think what are what are we paying? I guess there's some taxes on top of this, but we're paying like $86 a night for five-star hotel rooms for our event. You could go and stay. This is the most charming colonial hotel. I go there and have a drink every once in a while. You can have two cocktails for happy hour. They're wearing white dinner jackets. It's a beautiful ambiance. You can play billiards. There's people smoking fine cigars. Like rich people go there. It's nine bucks for two cocktails during happy hour, <laughs> seven days a week. At this eighty-six dollar a night colonial hotel with orchids and everyone's in a dinner jacket and it's like it's 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 really charming. I took my uh, the big boss out. We had a great like kind of a hawker stall lunch inside hawker stall. Everything's clean. Nine bucks. We ate like kings. So you can go and then you can also go to Nobu. You can also go to the you know Italian restaurant. Right. You're going to pay more for caviar. You're going to pay more for champagne. You're going to pay more for strawberries. But there's plenty of stuff you're going to pay less for. I mean, real estate is insane. It's cheaper be, than Eastern Europe now. Yeah, and you shouldn't eat 
eat don't eat western fruits so it's like i'm in brazil i'm like i don't yeah. need you know northern i don't need apples it's like brazil it's like give me something i mean although apples do grow in brazil but eat the food of in the all fairness, you're in if you had household staff uh, yeah. you know, they would go to the the market that's further yeah. away. You know, when you're just looking for convenience, you'll go to the store where everything's from New Zealand, for example. But if you're, you yes. know, if you're going to the market a few kilometers away, you'll still find apples at a reasonable price. It's just, it's you're not going to the, the you know the best and most luxurious supermarket. I think Kuala Lumpur is great. If you can live anywhere, if you're that couple from Georgia, if you're you, if mm -hmm. you're me, if you're your listener, I mean, if you go to Singapore, the house that I have, I've got like a almost a penthouse. I don't know, 3,300 square feet. I redid it. I'm probably all in for $600,000. In that neighborhood, that's probably seven or $8 million in Singapore for the yeah. equivalent in Singapore. And now Singapore will charge you a 60% tax. You're going to throw away millions of dollars just for the privilege of buying that property as a foreigner. So you're saying in Kuala Lumpur, yeah. something that costs you eight mil in Singapore costs you 600,000 in Kuala Lumpur and you don't have to pay this crazy tax. The, and, and the taxes are like, you know, let me, let me, so let me ask 2%. you, here. when I think yeah. of Asia where people go, yeah. traditionally, I think Westerners go to the Philippines, they go yeah. to Thailand. Now you hear Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia is starting to open up. Let's talk about yes. those for a second. What's your feelings on the Philippines in these more traditional kind of Western expat locales? Well, I mean, the Philippines is nice. And the Manila, like Fort Bonifacio, it's really come up. There's some really nice places. The real estate's much more expensive. I don't think the service is quite as good. I mean, the they're lovely people, the Philippines. Um, I mean, they're lovely people. They're all over the world. Um, I don't think that the quality is quite as good. You're on an island, so it's harder to get in and out of. It's more expensive to get in and out of. I mean, if you're in Malaysia, you can get anywhere you want. You're an hour from Singapore. Here's my system. And you can do this in any part of the world, but I've laid this out for Asia before. It's the global okay. citizen sandwich. The meat of your life in a global citizen sandwich is where you want to live. So yes. I'm in Malaysia part-time. You could be there part-time, full-time, whatever. Mm. That's the middle part. It's livable. It's, I would say, 85 to 90% as livable as Singapore. I would say it's actually in some cases more livable because there's they're a little bit more laid back in some things. There's not so many strict rules. So that's your middle part. Very livable, maybe not quite perfect, but almost there. The the bottom piece would be Singapore. That's where I'm going to have my assets. I'm going to go to one of those big three banks, and I'm going to put in whatever amount of money. People have tens of millions of dollars in those banks. We had a guy, half a billion dollar client. He's moving you know, $50 million in there. No one's worried. Now, on the other hand, on that other piece of the bread, I'm going to go to some of those emerging markets that I can go and look at. Again, a one or two hour flight away. I've been a big advocate of Cambodia for 10 years. I'm an investor in Cambodia. It's done incredibly well. The yields are high. Property prices are going through the roof um, because they were nothing. I mean, the country hasn't had a recession for 30 years. Yeah. Laos is starting to kind of sort of open up, but they're one of the few remaining communist countries and they mean it. Vietnam is doing well. It's harder to invest there. Um, I, I like Malaysia for this reason. It's one of the four countries in Asia you can own land is a foreigner, which is rare huh. in Asia. Okay. So you, you don't just own a condo, you can own the land. If you can buy a house. But yeah, I would invest in places like a Cambodia. I can also use my, and the other piece of the bread, my Singapore bank account to invest in Singapore, Hong Kong. I can buy Indonesian funds. I can buy Thai what, funds. What's the minimum somebody better. needs to have a yep. Singapore bank account? Let's say this Atlanta couple. Can they just yep. not go to Singapore and open a bank uh, account there? You have, or do you, you have to, to go? go? Yeah, for well, not all of them have to go. So, like, we have a, a lawyer that opens accounts in Georgia remotely, and and their minimum is like zero in Georgia. But if well, you want to go to Singapore, Singapore, yeah, probably a couple couple hundred grand, and, and you, you would need have to, to go, go in person to open these. Now, obviously, if you live in Singapore and you like, you start a company and you hire yourself and you're living there and you're paying right. their their low taxes, you'll get a bank account for a thousand dollars. But if you're just like, I want to take advantage of your top you know, yes. status, it's a couple hundred grand generally. So, so that brings up something. Where are some places you like to bank? You, I know Georgia because uh, we've talked for I think Singapore's years. right up there. Singapore, Georgia. You said you don't love South America. No. What about other European uh, locations? Any other places? You, would you bank in Estonia? Would you bank? Obviously, Ireland, you're probably going to bank a little bit in or – well, so there's a couple things. Number one, there's where do I want to put the bulk of my money, um, mm -hmm. where I'm going to you know store cash that I'm waiting to do a deal or I'm just parking it. 
that's probably going to be a Singapore. I think Switzerland and Liechtenstein, from my experience, are overrated. They're overpriced. I, don't, I think the service is worse. Sometimes I want to do a self-service transaction. That's harder in those countries. There's a lot of imperiousness. If I had to do private banking in Europe, <laughs> I guess I would go to Andorra. There's just so okay. much runaround. I went to Monaco. They're like, oh, you've lived in some weird places. We don't really want to open an account. I mean, for a million euros, they put you through the ringer. Uh, you know, so... If you li- if you want to live in Europe, you can get an account in some of those places like a like you know Coots in the UK, three million pounds, that kind of thing. But if you're just like the global citizen, I think nothing beats Singapore at the top. It's transactional, it's low fee, it's good service. Americans can't make investments, but everyone else can. They've got good access. Then I would maybe have my smaller accounts, my tunnels, my diversification, my higher interest rates. That could be a Georgia. Uh, Portugal, I guess, comes in there. And then I'm going to have, like, where do I live? Both for for tax reasons as well as just ease of operation. I wouldn't bank in Ireland other than I'm going to pay some local bills. Right. Right. And so, so a lot of these operating countries... operating account there, yeah. Yeah. So in Europe, if you're not... If you're taxed on remittance or whatever it may be, I would keep the money somewhere where it's... Where you want it to be. Like, most people think that where they live is where their banking is. And so, sure, uh, I think my wife has like an account in Colombia with five grand in it or something. And it's just kind of a pain to manage. But you got your five grand locally if you Would need you it. Would you do Dubai, by the way? Dubai, UAE is another one uh, that I guess – although I don't, I don't think that the standard of service there, quite frankly, as someone who's a company, I like Dubai. But this idea that it's some panacea – Right. I still think Singapore beats them in terms of private banking. Uh, I have a, the Bahamas uh, beats yeah. them. There's many countries that don't want you, by the way, to your point about Estonia. I mean, if you don't live in the Cayman Islands, you're going to have a hard time getting most Cayman banks to take you. Um, so the Bahamas is kind of in what that league. What about Estonia? Do they situation. want you to live in there? No. And they had that whole thing with Estonian e-residents where people were getting these little cards from their local embassy and thinking they were going to open bank accounts. And the banks were like, it's great that the government wants you here, but we don't. Right. We can't. I mean, Latvia was freezing everyone's bank accounts six or seven years ago because all the Russians were there and the Federal Reserve was pressuring their central bank and they were pressuring their banks. And so, I mean, if you're going to bank in most countries, you want to have a residence permit. So think about this. I want to buy properties around the world. Generally, having a property means I could open a bank account to pay my local bills. What if I want to put extra money in there? If you came and bought a property in Malaysia, but you didn't have immigration status, you could still probably get a bank account. And I think those banks are pretty darn safe. So, you know, you could move more money in by virtue of owning that property. So in a sense, it starts to kind of come together where either having a residence permit or having a property enables you to have a bank account, and then you can open more of them. I mean, look at Georgia. They still take foreigners, but like Armenia next door, the banks are a little bit more rigid. There's a few more international banks in Armenia, uh, like French banks, for example. Um, But now they want you to have a residence permit. For some people, it might not be the worst idea to get an Armenian residence permit as a backup. It could potentially lead to citizenship. It's kind of a different kind of country. And then you can get your bank account. But no, like most European countries won't let you just walk in off the street. Mostly they're the ones that are the emerging in Eastern Europe. Portugal, if you're going to tell them you're going to do immigration, maybe. Uh, or if you've got millions. I mean, if you've got a million dollars, we can, we can, we've got one bank in Switzerland, we like. Um, but but they you're going to pay. A, they want you to have a million. Liechtenstein is yeah. one that people – what about Luxembourg? Uh, I guess there's a few there for half a million euros or something, yeah. Uh, but Luxembourg si- and, so and Andorra. It sounds like Singapore is the spot that you – now you said Andorra. Are they having that same level of minimum, five hundred grand to a million? Yeah, I think five hundred to a million. Yeah, but here's Singapore's, my issue. Singapore is lower. It sounds like generally speaking. And here's my issue with the European private bankers: is they more want to control the relationship with you, and they're yeah. like, "Oh, we'll give you tax advice." And I'm sitting there asking them. I remember talking to a guy in Barcelona from from an Andorran bank about a year and a half ago. So what you know, what what are your bank's protections against U.S. citus assets? Like I'm not a U.S. taxpayer. So if I buy certain U.S. investments, at my death, I can be subject to a state tax with a very low minimum. It's not like $11 million in the U.S. It's, it's like $60,000 for me as a non-U.S. taxpayer. But there's very simple ways, you know, put your fund in Luxembourg, you know, do this, you know, throw it to – and he, he can't answer the question. And yeah. I just think that, like, I'd rather have something that's a bit more transactional, lower cost, and you kind of serve yourself a bit more. Uh, with, I would say, better stability in Singapore. I mean, those banks are some of the strongest 12, 13, 14 strongest banks on earth. Yeah. 
So now, I mean, the point is, you might want some big bank accounts in a place like Singapore. You might want some small bank accounts in a place like Georgia. You might want like an account where you're living or buying a property, but they all have a function. This idea that I live in the U.S., so I bank in the U.S., banish that from your mind. Yeah, for sure. And in the Singapore, just going back to that, since that's your favorite or sounds like one of the favorites. Yeah. For so this couple living in Atlanta, is it just they can do it without going to Singapore? They need to take a trip. They need to go to Singapore. They yeah. need to take a trip. But is it just showing up once or twice or is it saying, here's my apartment I have a monthly rent lease on? Is it do they have to take the next step? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's different for every bank. And by the way, there's banks. I mean, some banks don't take Americans. So like Liechtenstein, yeah. they're pretty stingy in Americans. Switzerland, we've got one that takes Americans. By the way, just got a quote back for someone. They want 12,000 francs a year just to have that relationship. Yeah. So. Um, and how know, much some, minimum? And how much minimum? I think that was a million francs. So 1.1 million U.S. So. You can find remote bank account openings. I mean, the Bank of the Bahamas, I don't think anyone goes to open that account in person. Um, but you're going to do more compliance. You're going to do yeah. more compliance than any of these. So I think that generally what you would do in Singapore is you would talk to the bank. Now, we have good relationships with them. It's very referral-based. They're not – like a good conservative bank is not desperate for every account holder that could potentially right. get them in trouble. They're not desperate for cash like some yes. of these U.S. banks. So, I mean, again, the guy with half a billion dollars said, hey, would you mind giving me your connection at one of the Singapore banks? Because they kind of brushed me off. The guy has half a billion dollars. His company just went public, and they don't want to talk to him. They're like, ah, are you sure? Are you sure this is what you want? So, I mean, if you just walk <laughs> enough the street, I mean, it's going to be hit or miss. If you know somebody, if you set it up in advance, you can do that. I would not just land in Singapore and expect to get it done in a day. Could you? Maybe. But, I mean, they're going to ask for stuff. Maybe you can send that afterwards. It's di I mean, the answer is it's different from bank to bank and banker to banker. But... Um, I quite frankly think you'd have an easier process and you would feel more comfortable moving money. I have millionaires who come and say, I'd like to move $25,000 offshore. I said, that's not much asset, much asset protection. Yeah. I mean, what if you went to the country and invested your time to see, oh my goodness, that's like a 60 story tower. You know, you'll start to feel more comfortable with it. Yes. By the way, for those of you listening, I'm going to put a link, tylopez.com slash nomad. The conference is coming up. In Kuala Lumpur, uh, Andrew does this conference, and there's hundreds of people coming in from around the world, the networking, the speakers. It's a multi-day event. I'm planning to go, so I highly recommend. We've got the show notes, but then if you want a direct link, tylopez.com slash nomad. That's my affiliate link. I'm an affiliate partner mm -hmm. with the conference. And, uh you know, some people will look at that and say, oh, do I really want to fly all the way to Malaysia? And I've never heard of that. I'll tell you what a uh, mentor to, to my, uh, a mentor told me when I was living in Beverly Hills. He was a neighbor. He was worth, I would say, between two and $500 million, one of the big landowners in uh, different parts of Beverly Hills. And he said, I, you know, I built a clothing line and I sold it to J.C. Penney every week for 20 years. I would get on a plane Sunday night. I'd fly to Italy, I'd look at the styles, and I'd fly home to see my kids on Wednesday. And he did that for 20 years, and he said, it wasn't a big deal. I learned how to travel. He said, Ty, if you want something, go after it. And I always thought that was interesting. He, he, what he was saying is, don't regard the difficulty of something. You know, he just thought, well, I want to travel. The, I, I'm willing to travel anywhere if it'll benefit my family, my tribe, my business, and my long-term financial legacy. So if you see, if you go to tylopas.com slash nomad and you're overwhelmed by the thought of going to Malaysia, go for three days, get on a plane, turn around and come back. I did this experiment myself after, you know, kind of coming to this conclusion that I'll go anywhere in the world where there's good information without regard. You know, it's like the, the Louis CK, the comedian says, we're the most spoiled generation and we've become weak-willed. You know, he's like, you're sitting on a chair in the sky, something that used to take people an entire lifetime to go from the U.S. or Europe to Malaysia. Now we can do it in under a day. Sure, it's a little bit uncomfortable. you got to pack your stuff, but you can sit in first class if you have some money. You can have somebody wait on you hand and foot. You can read three books. That's what I do when I go on these long trips. I'll read. I went to Australia. I read the entire autobiography of Napoleon Bonaparte, and so it's super productive, you know, so... If you see this, it's coming up in September. If you know you need to understand more about what you're hearing now and you need to be 
informing yourself on the global patterns that are unfolding in front of us. Because there is, and this is my opinion now, there is a distinct possibility that we're going to witness, whether it be AI, whether it be a global war, calamity, food systems breaking down. Don't think where you live now, which a first world country, a lot of my listeners are in the United States, don't think that empires don't fall. And the wisest people in the world always have a backup plan. So whether you actually want to leave the U.S. or Europe, that's an irrelevant point. The point is smart people have backup plans, even if they don't deploy all their assets into them. So I'm a big believer. It's like who wouldn't have some kind of a global asset? I mean, you'd be insane to not have one. I have a lot of people following me doing Airbnb. I mean, okay, you do it in you know, Los Angeles. Well, why wouldn't you have one in an outside country, whether it be Colombia or, you know, Europe. There was a, I was just with a student of mine and, you know, the, there was a guy in the UK did $21 million in Airbnb rentals, netted 10 million bucks, diversified globally. So come, if you can, September, don't think about how long the trip is. That's irrelevant. Read a book, think, bring a yellow notepad like Bill Gates built his entire business plan for Microsoft by locking himself in a hotel as a teenager for three days or five days. So lock yourself on the airplane. You're locked in, bring your plans, map out your next 18 months of your business, read two books. And the next thing you know, you're landing in Kuala Lumpur. It's safe. It's super cheap. You know, you're staying for a hundred bucks a night. So tylopez.com slash nomad. Can I, I'll tell, oh, let me tell yeah. you what else you can do, by the way. Uh, and and from what I found in my experience of all my travels, once you're on the plane, you're on the plane. Mm -hmm. I almost prefer going to a place like Kuala Lumpur because if I'm going from like Istanbul to Kuala Lumpur, that's 11 hours. Yeah. I can actually like I do I have a nice meal. I do what you're saying. I get a lot of stuff done, more productive on a plane than anywhere else. And I get some I get some sleep and I arrive refreshed. But here's what I did that I think people here's a, a way to dip a toe in without committing any funds. Go to I go to Prince Court Medical Center. I don't get paid. To, I'm not an affiliate of Prince Court Medical Center, but I go every year. And I paid this year $301. I guess it's a little bit cheaper now with the exchange rate. But I paid $301. I got the most intense physical. You go at whatever time you choose. I went at 930. I'm out by 12 o'clock. They rush you to the front of every line. Radiology, ultrasound, I mean, everywhere. You get every test you can do. Blood tests out the wazoo. Every test. Then you go and see the doctor. Then you go to, they give you a beautiful lunch. Then you go and you come back at like 3.30 and the doctor actually answers all of your questions. They're all trained in the UK. They don't work at this hospital if they're not trained in the UK. Um, and they, you've never seen anything like it. This is probably $10,000 in the US. Yeah, so what I'm $300. Is, wow. I 300 bucks. And I've never, I mean, by the way, I've been to the emergency room for like a contact stuck in my eye in the US and it's two grand and they give you the bums rush out the front door as fast as they can. I would suggest, I mean, come and look at the countries you're talking about. We've got guys talking about investing in Cambodia, investing in Latin America. Um, you know, go and see one of these places next door. Go to Singapore. We're going to talk about bank accounts you can open from $0 to, to $5 million and, and everything in between. Um, so, but, but I would say come and put some feet in the ground. If you have the time, do some of the other stuff we're talking about. See what it's like to live in a kind of place. And I think your mind will open up. People tell me, Ty, there's nowhere to go. What happens when the U.S. – oh, if the U.S. falls, everything falls. That's because you're thinking Canada, the U.K., all the places on your normal radar. You're probably not thinking what happens to Malaysia if the U.S. Right. sinks. Malaysia's been on the upswing. I mean, just go and watch the movie Entrapment 25 years ago. I mean, the place looked a lot different than it does now. It's incredible. So, yeah, we put together a lot of great people from Jim Rogers all the way on down. About how, it's four days of solid information. So it's, uh, there's no fluff. So let me ask you now asset protection. So what do you think of there's traditional places or not traditional, but there's places people have gone. Americans think often of Switzerland and this, that. But what about places like Cook Islands, for yeah. example? Common place where people are setting up LLCs, trusts, bank accounts. What's your thoughts on, you know, a Nevis, a uh, Cook Island, some of those places? Well, I for think, those of you who oh, don't know, Cook Island is an island. It's kind of an affiliate of New Zealand. New Zealand, yeah. 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 Um, and a better reputation than like the one 
between Australia and New Zealand named Vanuatu, which I've right. been to, which is, you know, Vanuatu and Belize, if you have like a company there, it's probably like you're assumed to be involved in some terrible activity. <laughs> Pablo Escobar. Right? Yeah, something. I don't know. But um, the Marshall Islands, maybe another one. Uh, but yeah, I think what a lot of North Americans want is common law. And so you don't really have that in Europe. You have foundations in places in Europe. It's a little bit different. So the Cook Islands is, is certainly the, the gold standard of asset protection. You're going to pay more for it. We, we set up Cook Islands trusts for folks. Um, by the way, before you open your bank accounts, if you're going to have a $1 million bank account, is that bank account going to be in a trust or is it going to be in your own name? Because that Swiss bank account, the one advantage they have generally over Singapore is Singaporeans because their taxes are so low and they don't really have an estate tax. They don't really use trusts. They don't need mm. to. Whereas like Swiss banks are familiar with, okay, we'll open an account for your trust. Yes. So before you even open the bank account, it's important to have kind of the holistic view. This is what we talk about in our business, what we talk about at our event. I think the Cook Islands is the best. Certainly, again, is the goody two shoes of the offshore world. I don't like to, I mean, you know, they, they've told the IRS to pound sand on some occasions. If you're living in the U.S., I wouldn't tell the IRS to pound. I, mean, I, I wouldn't tell, I don't live in the U.S., and I wouldn't tell them to pound sand overseas. I just structure myself to avoid them. But, I mean, they have shown, like, listen, we follow our own rules. Um, so, you know, Belize has trust, Bahamas has trust, Nevis does. I don't like these as much for incorporation. I think onshore is the new offshore for incorporation. Seychelles, Belize, Vanuatu, all that is out, I think, for incorporation. In are the Hong Kongs, the UAEs, the Isle of Mans, the Caymans, maybe the Bahamas. Um, those are the so places for business. Well, why, why do you like those more for incorporation? You're talking about no, an operating type company. I, right. So if I have yeah. a holding company, I we might have a, a holding company, the BVI, for example, just to hold stocks or something, yes. or to hold equity in different companies. That could potentially work. But, I mean, try getting a bank account for a Belize company somewhere. I yeah. guess, it, again, if you want to put in $5 million on some Swiss bank, they'll charge you a lot of fees because they're going to say, our compliance has got to do yes. a crazy job on this one. Um, so obviously the more money you have, the more flexible it is. But if I'm the average person that you're talking about in Georgia, um, the, the state now, um, uh, you know, I'm not going to set up my company where nobody wants to bank me. I mean, it we used to be, right. you could open a, a bank account for a British Virgin Islands company, which is not the lowest of the low. There's still some respect there. They used to be able to open those in Singapore, $30,000. They don't really want that anymore. So mm. th these good banks are becoming more and more risk averse. But for a trust, they understand, okay, it's a trust. It's passive. It just holds stuff. The Cook Islands can work. Bahamas can work. Uh, those kind of places. Yeah. So again, I'm, I'm always looking- Do you think there's value in, let's say, an American citizen or someone no. from the Western world in having a trust structure hold some of their assets, if not the majority? Uh, well, it's somewhat a personal decision. I mean, some people who are entrepreneurs, they're just control freaks. I mean, you ha let's be clear. You have a, a trustee who's responsible for you know handling those assets, and they're supposed to follow your instructions. I think they're overprescribed, but I think if you have you know $2 million or more, I would start looking at doing that. Is it worth going to the Cook Islands? I mean, maybe. If you're, if you're going to keep making money, sure. I, I, I believe in paying for quality. Um, I don't think that everybody who has a hundred grand to put in should be sold a trust. Right. Um, but if I mean, somebody, think, let's say somebody predicts, I've got a business, yep. it's going to, it could generate between two and a hundred million dollars of free cash flow over the next 10, 20 years. Do you see that as a viable option? Sure. Just running it through a trust. Again, be, let's be clear that if you are a U.S. citizen or if you live in the U.S., I mean, you're going to have to file forms for that trust. So there's going to be a little bit of a burden. It's not like, oh, I just get to hide the asset. The asset no, no, is not, not hidden. Not necessarily for hiding. Asset purposes. protection. From the, you, you can't hide from the IRS. It, it's you're not, not hiding. No, this is not an intelligent thing. The IRS is a powerful organization. You're They're smarter than people think. Well, and, and they're just, they have pull, man. You're probably better yeah. off pissing off, you know, the Colombian mafia than, <laughs> than the, the U.S. Uh, IRS, which is I, ultimately I, backed by the U.S. military. So at the end of the day, U.S. can exert power anywhere through the largest, you know, we have 10 times more air, aircraft carriers than any country in the world. Like, I you, was you, 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 you look at these countries where the immigrants come from, like, you know, Patrick Bay David, was, he's from Iran. Like, Iran is not following you around the world. Now, if you go back no. to Iran, maybe they're going to screw with you. But, yes. like, 
you know, or, or, you know, even Turkey, they're like looking for some of the guys that they think are, are terrorists in Sweden and the U S they don't really have the power to say, but the U S has the power. Yeah. Right. So you don't has, want to screw has, them. Has power both politically through their diplomats and their, I, I if, was, if, uh, if you're Iranian and you were like, all right, who cares about the Iranian IRS? Right. Now that I'm got, all right. I don't know how that works, but I do know the U S IRS. Yeah. You don't want to screw with them. I was in Sweden, um, in Stockholm when the kind of Ukrainian, uh, conflict started and I woke up, you know, there was the Swedish Navy was out in the Harbor and they had a boat. I'm just going to put my hand up, you know, because I'm on, it, it was a, to scale. It was approximately this big, this naval ship. And then I woke up the next day and I was staying at that. There's a hotel there right by the Harbor. And here come all these U S generals coming in to stay at the hotel and I look out and there's the U, a U, not even an aircraft carrier. So whatever, a destroyer. I don't even know the terminology. Here's this big Swedish one and the American one doesn't even fit on the thing. And the IRS has that behind them. And yeah. so, so forget any kind of tax avoidance or hiding or anything. I mean, avoidance Do you maybe, see but, other yeah. things for the trust? People go for yeah. trust for litigation. Right. Somebody falls down the stairs, you're a multi-billionaire or, or a multi-millionaire in the U.S. and you live in Denver, Colorado, and somebody falls down the stairs or your horse gets out on your horse farm and somebody gets killed and they say, we want 100 mil or right. uh, alternatively, you get divorced. <laughs> There's a famous trust case a guy just did in Texas where you know he was going to get taken for a lot of money and he ended up being going, as the Rockefellers used to say, own nothing, control everything. So do you think that for people a little bit higher net worth that follow yeah. me, two to 20 million, you know, do you think trusts begin to become part of that equation? Global I do. Trust. I do. I think or that Wyoming, I'm, you know, people like in Wyoming well, now. Yeah. I mean, I, I listen, I, I'm, I'm the nomad capitalist. I'm not the, uh, you know, it's not go where you're treated better. Our slogan is go where you're treated best. I mean, maybe Wyoming <laughs> is better. Best would be probably the Cook Islands or something like that. So, I mean, understand, by the way, uh, like our live event, it's more expensive than most live events because we have no sponsors, but also because, I mean, I've spent 16 years traversing the world figuring this stuff out, and I think yeah. there's a value there in a very expensive industry where people oftentimes overpay for stuff. I mean, there's people in New York that'll charge you 80 grand to set up a Cook Islands Trust. Yes. Uh, so before you spend 80 grand or some fraction of 80 grand, if you're not doing it with some Park Avenue firm, you probably want to make sure you actually need it. I mean, we have people who come to us and say, I want to get citizenship in the Caribbean for $100,000. And I say, it's a good backup, but for the reasons you're giving me, you probably don't need it right now. Oh, okay. Well, you know, I mean, there's, there's lots of people trying to sell you some very expensive stuff in this space. So I think there's a place for trust. What I would point out on your example of, I have a business, potentially for the ambulance chasers, uh, you know, if I'm running an active business, let's say your e your e learning you know business, it's possible, not legal advice, but it's possible in some situations, merely having the company somewhere else without yes. a trust. I mean, maybe a trust owning the company adds even more. But you know, if the company is in the UAE and the bank accounts in Switzerland, that's still a lot harder to go after. Yes. Uh, than just oh, the, the money's on the street. I by the way. I've seen this uh, firsthand. I spent six months in California about 16 years ago when I was first researching like Cambodia and places like that. And I came back to Arizona where I was living and my accountant said, well, you probably should file a, a dual California return. I paid the bill. It wasn't a lot back then. And I woke up one day a few months later, the, the franchise tax board, which is even worse oh, yeah. than the IRS, you know. Yes. They just reached into my account and took out some money. I said, yeah. I have a canceled check. I paid you. Oh, we don't. And you have to call them and fight with them, and they really are nasty to you. Yeah. And you, you realize my company was not in California. My bank yes. had a presence in California, but it's an yes. Arizona bank. You realize just how easy it is for people to make a mistake even. Yes. I'm not saying don't pay people what they're owed, but it would be nice they can't just boop, push one button and all your money goes away. Yeah, there's levies and there's liens. People don't realize there's liens where they have a hold and there's a levy where it's an extraction. You just take it right out. California franchi Franchise Board put a levy on you. So that brings up something interesting. What's your take on crypto? I think my approach 
is a bit more conservative, and I think it's a part of a portfolio. It's part of our portfolio for myself. It's part of our company's treasury management. I'm not someone who's 100% Bitcoin. You know, we have um, people like Roger Ver. I mean, Roger Ver, I think, was buying Bitcoin for pennies. And, uh, you know, <laughs> a guy like that has a lot of money. We had Max Kaiser last year. I mean, he's all in. Um, I don't, I'm not, I'm not all in at anything. And I think that, you know, you mentioned something earlier. My, my strategy is I'm not the most confident person in myself. I like to make sure I've got many different options. I'm not, mo I'm not confident in anything. Right. And, and so I look at it and I say, if I'm living in the United States, what's the downside of having some money in Singapore where the banks are statistically more safe? Like, what do I lose right. by doing that to your point? Yeah. And I look at the same thing in the context of, you know, I might lose something having, you know, Bitcoin. I'm obviously in the last year and a half, I've lost something on paper. Uh, you know, I think it's a good asset protection tool. I would add that, by the way, my list of things to be internationalized, put some on a hard wallet, rent a safe deposit box, not with a bank, but with a private facility. Um, you know, whether it's in Singapore or Austria, or whatever else, with it's a private facility, they just have your information internally. Um, as long as the police don't come looking for you, it's not going to be reported. Uh, necessarily that you have that box and and put it there. I like to have assets I can go to and I can get. And so this idea that I'm going to be people would say, you know, escaping Ukraine with my ledger in my in my pocket. Uh, what if something happened to my house in Ukraine and the ledger is right. not there anymore? I'd like the ledger to be somewhere safe. So you and like again, physical storage? Would you put gold there too? Are you a fan of gold? Yeah, yeah, I like gold and silver. Sure, I mean we have, but we have guys. Gold, not some people are like, oh, I have a gold, you know, index no, fund or this. That's You're rubbish. Talking. And no. you're putting it where you where do you like Singapore? You said Austria. Austria's uh, not well. Austria used to have anonymous boxes where you could just not even provide an ID, and some oh, people wow. like that. They they got rid of that a couple of years ago. But yeah, there's facilities where you're still. I mean, you're known, but they're not reporting it to anybody. So again, yes. unless like someone's coming, like unless you're the FTX guy, no one's coming in. Like, hey, where's Would you Henderson's do Uruguay? Crypto? Would you do? I, I, I think I, I like Caymans. I like like the free zone locations. Like Singapore has the the free port, the free ports. So Singapore is the free port. Like under the Zurich Airport is a free port. Like I like those like like James Bond level safe. Mm, okay. Like like I've been to some of those facilities in <laughs> Panama. I can't say I was blown away. I did not go to the ones in Uruguay. So where you are know, some of those? Singapore, one. Where's three places? Uh, Zurich, Frankfurt, I guess Amsterdam, maybe. I think the big ones for me are Switzerland, where you're generally going to pay more. We've got a company where we get the same rates in Switzerland as we do in Singapore. But generally, again, Switzerland, it's triple Yeah. Uh, if you just go on your own. By the way, for all of you listening, I wanted to throw out one thing. Tylopez.com, for the show notes, I'm going to put a link to Nomad Capitalist Private Consulting, which mm -hmm. he's done for me over the years. Uh, for those of you who are just, you know, have a small amount of money that you want to diversify, it's not the right thing for you. But for those of you who are more sophisticated and you want Andrew's team, like I said, this is I'm an affiliate, but I actually did this years ago when I was an affiliate. So I can objectively tell you this is something I've paid money to Andrew and, and his team. So when you go to tylopez.com slash Andrew podcast, tylopez.com slash Andrew podcast in the show notes, I'll have a link to his private consulting. On the show notes, we'll have his website. You can join the free email list, get value. We'll have a link to the Kuala Lumpur upcoming September event, and we will have a link to the private consulting. You know, it's kind of like three levels. If you just want to dip your toe in this, you go to tylerbiz.com slash Andrew podcast. You get on the email list. We'll have the link. If you're a little more like, I, I see the value of going global, then look at coming to one of the in-person conferences. We'll have that link. But if you're somebody who goes, man, I'm not gonna be able to figure this out. I have a more complex, uh, you know, estate. And again, he's not a lawyer, so he's gonna coordinate, and his team's gonna help you coordinate with. Here's some law firms globally. Here's some bankers. Here's some accounting firms. So think of him as kind of a quarterback and a coordinator, hands on. And and I went through that and uh, got some really good value from that. That's the more Appreciate expensive that. package. Yeah. So so going back to that on, the, and I don't want to put a link to some of these. Um, locations, like you said, these free ports where pay, maybe people can store some things. I think that'll be a valuable link. Um, what What do you think, as we kind of wrap up here, just I want to do kind of a rapid fire section. I like to just sure. ask quick, maybe a thumbs up, kind of thumbs down with one sentence. What do you think about Scandinavia? Efficient, interesting people, uh, a little too cold. 
I, I can't pay so much tax. I just can't. It's not worth right. it. No place Although is worth you, it. You don't want to be there 12 months out of the year, but you can move around through it. In, so, which is my second question. Great place to visit. Africa right now. Where? People talk about Rwanda. I think Egypt has a lot of potential. We're going to be talking about that at the event. Uh, Morocco, maybe for some lifestyle stuff. Mm. Um, you know, West Africa, there's some interesting areas. Uh, Kenya has a lot of tech stuff. So obviously a huge continent. I've got, we've had a few African clients who are doing amazing stuff like in Namibia, even the Congo. I mean, you can make it, if you're 18 years old and you want to go somewhere and just have a wild time, Southeast <laughs> Asia, even wild, there would be some of these places in Africa. I got guys, I mean, running the most basic companies going nuts. Um, but I guess Rwanda, Egypt, or two that stand out, Kenya. Okay, next bullet question here. Most beautiful women you've encountered, you had to pick three countries. Where were you blown away? And this is just pure physical beauty. Don't factor in anything else. I'll ask that as a second question about sanity level. <laughs> but just raw shocked when you got off the airplane. What's the three places? Uh, Russia, Indonesia, perhaps Colombia. Okay. I mean, Russia, I think you could put that into category. You could say uh, the numerous Slavic countries. You could say Serbia also, but yeah. So overall, I, I have a new course that I launched called 13 Thesis. It's kind of a community, a tribe where we help people find long-term mating. It's the science of sex and long-term mating. And so let's factor in the sanity level, emotional stability, and beauty, not just physical beauty, but also somebody you would consider having kids with. What are those three places? Are they the same places? Or when you add that factor, does that change the equation? My, my wife is really, well, being growing up in Moscow, is really Georgian and ethnicity is really Armenian. And I would say Georgia and Armenia are probably places that are old school, but maybe not quite as old school as we talked about earlier. You have the, <laughs> you have, well, I was just saying, they're not the flagship for Armenia. Yeah, I was like, you have the intelligence, you have the worldliness. I mean, people in that part of the world, there's a worldliness, yeah. uh, which is what why we've done a lot of hiring in that part of the world. There's other inexpensive places, and we're not necessarily paying these people low salaries after a while. But I, I think that could work um, to have kids. I mean, I, you know, there's there are places in Asia. Um, I mean, is Indonesia, I, I think it de I mean, obviously depends on the person. There's a lot of people in Indonesia and the Philippines. They're just kind of like, I want a simple life. Just buy yeah. me a motorcycle. That's all I ever dreamed about. Probably not <laughs> what you and I want to have kids with. I think right. Eastern Europe for someone like us probably does that. It's Georgia. It's Armenia. Um, that's probably, but I mean, you could, you know, again, have a friend, his wife is Venezuelan. I mean, mm -hmm. absolutely top notch on every level, but you know, I'm saying kind of the number going by the numbers. Thoughts on Bali? It's been overrun. Um, it depends where in Bali. I, I I'm a city person. I don't have a huge tribe, and mm -hmm. I feel a little bit out of place there. I don't like the good vibes, bra kind of thing. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's I think that covers up other issues people have. Beautiful place. I think there's yeah. other places. Once everyone knows about it, it's probably too late. And yeah. I think that if you're trying to build a huge business and you want to build an empire, you're probably going to fall into a bit of a wall of shame there where people are going to tell you to relax and chill out. And for me, that's mm -hmm. why I left the U.S. because I was 21 and starting a business and starting to become relatively successful. And girls were like making fun of me because I would wear a tie. Right. Um, and that's how I wanted to dress. That, yeah. Yeah, and I just don't want that. And, you know, so I went to China, for example, and girls like, oh, you're still like, that's incredible. You should be 50 years old and starting a business. I, I think that the people you'd hang out with in <laughs> Bali, if you're trying to build the, the $29.5 million business, and by the way, had a guy come to one of our small group events, client events, many, many years ago. He said, you're never going to build a $100 million company living in some of these places. He said, even here in Kuala Lumpur, I think our company – uh, could be you know somewhat close to that, and I've spent a lot of time in Kuala Lumpur. Maybe I have an obscene level of dedication that most people don't, but I well, think Warren, Bali would be Buffett, harder. Warren Buffett proved it wrong. Nebraska, everybody, yeah, everybody said you had to live in you know be a banker well, in private I, I, equity I, in New York. Is that I'm going different. to Nebraska? That's where I true. want to live. Brains and strategy can trump many things. What about the city of London? 
If you wanted to be in a major Western city, would you ever recommend anybody be in London, UK? Well, I think you've seen people talk about how it's less safe. I, I would go there. Here's the challenge. Last year, we had Nigel Farage. I said, you guys did Brexit. He was at our event last year. I said, you guys did Brexit. And then you shut off all the entrepreneur and investor visas, essentially. Right. So unless you're Irish or British citizen, yes. it's going to be very hard for you to move to the UK. Yeah. It would have been a consideration. I think Ireland is better for a place to live. I, mean, I don't know that they want people like us. If you had to be in the U.S., what city are you going to be? For whatever reason, hypothetical, you got to live in the United States majority of the year. Where are you going? Two cities. If, if tax doesn't matter? Tax. Yeah. Let's, no, no. Let's take, take the U.S. as it is now. All factors. But for whatever reason, you had to live in the U.S. for the next two years straight. Yeah. Two cities. I I don't know. I don't know that I'm a Texas guy, and I feel like Austin has kind of been overrun by L.A. Uh, or San Fran, or San Fran, or even near. I, I guess I'd probably go to Miami because I'm closer to Europe. Mm -hmm. uh, you could, you know, you could date all the, you know. I mean, I wouldn't be. You would be. I would enjoy the being around the uh, the 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 Latinas, uh, but uh, I guess I'd go to Miami. I think for me, part What's of why I like place, though. I well, it, it's not tax friendly, but it, it listen. I don't think the state makes a huge difference. I think all these guys who are moving to Florida to save, you know, 7% are lying to themselves because you're not right. saving 37.6% plus Social Security, plus Medicare, plus this, plus that. Uh, I'd, I'd go to Boston. And I know that there's mm. nobody okay. like, oh, I mean, Kevin O'Leary, I guess, was there. Like, there's other people who are there. I, you know, I would enjoy a bit of a bit of intellectual kind of okay. pursuits. D.C. Uh, is a smart person city, too. D.C., everybody oh, sends bureaucrats, smart man. No, no, not, not those. It's the people who come and are sent there by their country. Every country in the oh. world sends brilliant people to – it's an underrated city, um, although, like you said, you got the swamp. So it's last so question here. I, I Sorry, I have two questions that are super important that I ask everybody, and then we're going to end here. So take a second to think about this first question. This is two to five-minute answer. Okay, So not super short, but not super long. What is the most important lesson or lessons you have learned about creating income, multiple streams of, streams of income, financial independence, and wealth, specifically making money? You have a very uh, successful, profitable business, Nomad Capitalist. If you were passing this on to your children and you got one, two to five minute speech to them, what are you saying specifically on making money? If we're talking about what I would tell my children, it's what I've thought about in the context of would I ever sell my business. Hmm. So I don't have children, but I imagine I saw my father working hard, and I worked hard, and that's what got me where I am. We are still, to this day, refining things where we did a lot of hard work, but you need a bit more analytics. You need a bit more of this. You need a bit more that. I know that you're very strong at that. I struggle with how I could raise children and try and tell them, you know, for 20 years, I really toiled like a dog. But now, you know, they're like, Dad, you're just sitting at home all day. Like, you're not really doing anything. And, you're, and look at this beautiful house we live in. They'd be like, oh, I used to work hard. Ah, come on. I don't know how you would teach kids uh, the value of hard work. I think that's all it comes down to. Now, uh, my father once told me he was like one of the top guys in his, you know, asset management firm. And I'd say, why do you have the corner office? And he would say, well, this guy over here is a better salesperson. But he's just such a difficult guy to get along with. And the talent mm. alone doesn't get him there. The hard work, being humble, gets you there. That's what I think is a big percentage of the equation. I think, obviously, skills can be acquired. Talent is overrated. I mean, look at our company. We've hired people from the corporate world. I mean, I don't know how these corporations make it uh, with some of these people, <laughs> honestly. I think it comes down to just a lot of repetitive hard work. I mean, look at, our, look at when you say, where do you send people to know Metacapolist? You're everywhere. I mean, you're, you're more everywhere than we are. But compared to most people, most people are like, I'll just start a YouTube channel. I said, we got to do everything. And it's been exhausting at times uh, building out that team to do that. Um, but it just for me was always do more. And so in terms of building income, that's what I would suggest. I think before you master multiple income streams, I mean, you want to master one. Um, mm -hmm. So get that one that goes to then fund all the other ones. And I think that lastly... You've got to control how much money you keep. I see all these guys on YouTube, and they talk about, you know, I'm the $100 million CEO. What does that mean? Does that mean your company's revenue over the last 10 years is $100 million? I mean, that doesn't really tell you much, because you talked about, you know, 15% margins for some of these businesses. 
That scares me, by the way. Get your margins higher. I mean, get your margins to 50%, not 15%, 60%. I mean, you got to keep more of the money in the business, but then you've got to keep more of the money on taxes. I mean, I look at, uh, there was a guy on YouTube, he bought a private jet for a tax loophole. Never make inorganic decisions to save on taxes. Rather control your circumstances to fit where you want to be, right? If I want to buy a jet, I buy a jet. But I realize, you know what? I don't want to buy a $14 million jet. I just don't, I mean, I guess I could buy it. You could afford to buy it more than I could, but I just, I couldn't justify it. And I don't want to be forced to justify it because I'm giving half of my money away. And so right. I would follow the hard work and humility strategy. I would try and have a business that had high margins. I would not go into manufacturing, you know, I don't know, some, some widget that makes three cents on the dollar. And then I would focus on if I can keep 40% in, you know, of my money that's going in taxes, I'm going to be able to reinvest that, and I'm going to turbocharge my results and blow past everyone. That's fascinating. That's a great framework of wealth. High margins, hard work, and then reinvest for hyper growth. That's good. Yeah, that's good. So last question, then we'll wrap up. I ask this any smart person I meet. Let's say you decided to take the next jet, or I should say spaceship, to Mars with Elon Musk. This is your last day on Earth, and you wanted to be a mentor to the world, to the people you love and you leave behind. What is the, you know, five minutes? What do you say to them? And this does not have to only be about money. This can, you know, this should be health, wealth, love, happiness. What are the things that you've learned on this Earth that you would want to pass on as a mentor of sorts, a five-minute mentor to the world as you stand on the rocket ship getting ready to go into the door? Again, our five magic words are go where you're treated best. And people think, oh, he just talks about paying less in taxes. Let me tell you why that's important, just as I'm sure you do. People come up to me all the time uh, in all different places all around the world and say, I've inspired them to do something. People come to our live events. I had a guy last year. I went to Columbia because of you. I was a little bit older, a little bit older guy. I met the love of my life in Columbia, and they've been married for a couple of years now. And I got at 12 years old a permission slip of sorts from my father when he told me, don't think you have to stay in the same city, the same state, or even the same country to take care of your parents when they get older. You should go where you are treated best. And he was a big believer. We talked about it around the kitchen table from the time I was 12 or 13 years old. The West would not be what it once was. There'd be more competition. The West would not be as significant. We've seen that playing out in in the margins. There are fewer people are holding money in US dollars, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, all my friends felt they had to stay where I grew up because that was the right thing to do. That permission slip allowed me to live without regrets. I've done things maybe I wouldn't do again, but I don't live, I don't do regret. I think too many people are letting other people live their lives. And I've been on the phone with guys who are crying because their girlfriend doesn't want to doesn't want to move on this allegedly tax saving journey. But for them, it's an adventure, and they want to see the world, and they want to see what's happening. And the girlfriend or the wife doesn't want to go, and they're not sure what to do. And I think too many people are letting everyone else, especially entrepreneurs, shame them, ask them questions like, why do you care about that? And they're letting it get into their head. I think entrepreneurs, I've talked to a lot, they're some of the worst. We are some of the worst at this. We'll be, we're so different than most people. And people can shame you. And so go where you're treated best for me was if you want to go, if you don't feel like you have the social opportunities where you live, I think there's a geographical solution to every problem. And it's not just about your money. Huh. It's about happiness. Um, it's about, you know, the society you live in. It's about uh, health in some ways, a healthier culture. But don't let people hold you back by saying, that's not possible. You shouldn't do that. But what about your family? Listen, maybe you don't want to do the stuff that we're talking about today. But however you apply that, go where you are treated best, not only physically, but the people you surround yourself with, the opinions you let into your head. And the more of a change maker that you are, the more you're going to have to push away opinions from People who, quite frankly, don't understand you. They literally don't understand. You should go where you are treated best. I love that. I love the 
uh, almost every problem has a geographical solution. That's, yeah. That is an underrated statement. Well, Andrew, this was amazing. I hope to have you on again. For those of you listening, make sure you go study the show notes, the links, tylopez.com slash Andrew podcast. If you want to specifically get a ticket for the event, you can go to tylopez.com slash nomad. But thanks a lot, Andrew. And uh, this was amazing. For those of you watching where you can comment like YouTube, leave a comment on the one golden nugget you took away from this so that other people can scan through and know this is a you know worth listening to. So if you're on podcast, leave a review and, and mention this podcast episode. If you're on YouTube or Facebook, leave a comment on the golden nugget you got. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Ty. Pleasure.